Hi, my name is Juana Marku and I am a scientist and I am also a member of the F50 Global Committee. And I wanted to thank David Tao and the F50 team uh, for their huge effort to put together this summit and for the invitation to speak. So I am trained actually as a developmental biologist and I used to teach a graduate course in how body patterns form starting from one cell. And then I ended up working at NASA in the SETI Institute with projects for astrobiology and life sciences on the International Space Station. But the core of it was looking at stress responses induced by the environment. So I've had the luck through look my whole life through a microscope and also through a telescope. And I like this um, scale of things um, that is both temporal and spatial. And how do we apply this to the fundamentals of health? Can we address health or the root fundamental cause of things? So it really caught my attention um, this year on the scale of things. The first article of this year on January 1st was that all viable solutions for global sustainability are have to be designed and implemented locally. And then of course we find out that all local problems become global very quickly as well. So I want to take you to the, this really, really quick and whirlwind of personal health and what is really the onset of disease and how we are completely dependent on our social networks for health and our environmental networks. Upstream cinema made uh, a few years back this movie called In Utero, with the message is how we begin is who we become. And the fact that uh, personal health starts with the health of the mother. So there's a lot known about the mother environment and how important prenatal and the neonatal critical period are, and then we continue with the parental care. I think though, what we are not fully addressing as a society is how important this is for our health later on long term. If the parents' state of health and well being affect the child so much, well, they were children too. So, where does the buck stop? In the last about 10 years, there's this explosion in this field of epigenetics and transgenerator transmission or transgenerational inheritance. Um, Rachel Yehuda from Mount Sinai showed transgenerational transmission of cortisol and the risk of PTSD. Uh, we now know that generations today are affected by the famine and starvation that their parents and grandparents and great grandparents have gone through. I picked this cortisol pathway because it is such a good example of the absolute complexity of what's happening in our body. Here's a network of um, all the metabolic networks that cortisol regulates. So here is pretty much, if this happened, good luck trying to find a drug that's very specific and precise. And by now we know that anxiety and depression are linked to childhood and generational trauma, that autoimmune diseases have a very, very early onset. It can start in utero. Here is an encryption in a slab at Stanford University in front of the Beckman Center that reads, at the heart of the immune system is the ability to distinguish between self and non-self. Children who are raised in a difficult environment, born, um, born and raised in a different difficult environment, have lost this ability. Their immune and brain immune system and brains have lost the ability to distinguish between self and non-self. So there's a turning in. These epigenetic factors really affect neurodegenerative diseases as well. And it's not just at the level of the DNA, although of course DNA is ultimately is always affected, but there's also protein-based inheritance and epigenetics beyond the DNA. So with all this wealth, it seems like such a complicated deal, where do we look? So it turns out that our bodies are the keepers of the score. This is a book by Bessel van der Kolk, who was a medical doctor out of Boston, and he teaches trauma and how we need to integrate the brain, mind, and body in the healing. And I want to pause a little bit here and say, when we think of trauma is this big thing, but in fact, a small incident in a child's life can be very traumatic. So as it turns out, not just our body keeps the score, but our brains keep the score all the time. Um, it's a very good news that both the body and the brain 
have an immense capacity for resilience and recovery that I feel is really untapped. And it's not up to the medical system to do this. It's up to us as individuals and as a society to start tapping in the power of plasticity of our own biology. Here's a map of states of being of emotions, basically. And if you look, it might as well be a heat map of our bodies. And this will ultimately drive our physical state of being. And if it's not addressed, it will end up uh, in personal issues as addictions and suppressed immune systems. But really, this is not just a health problem. This is a work environment health problem and a business health problem. Oftentimes, major, major decisions in businesses on the world are made based on emotions that are on uh, their onset, their or origin is somewhere either in our childhood or in the childhood of our parents or grand grandparents. So this brings up this chain of reaction that we really need to solve at the root. Financial health as well is driven by generational and childhood imprinting and what happened in the family of origin and our success in life. I want to move right now uh, really quickly to um, what we call social health. And it really struck my attention in this blog about um, a, a paper in a, from the Canadian Medical Association that the rate of bullying it is so high that children's experience of bullying are almost as common as high school graduation. And yes, we're trying to address actively this problem, but one of the questions I feel it's not asked really and addressed is what makes our children behave this way? Where did they learn to do this? If not addressed, all this depression will end up in addictions, which are a huge problem. Um, this is data pulled from the World Health Organization and CDC in number of deaths per year. And you can see actually that the lead, number one leading cause of death in the world is cardiovascular disease. With one in the US, we have one heart attack every 40 seconds. What we, and also 9 million of people dying of hunger on a planet that we can really afford to feed. We have 5.5 million, uh, million seniors food insecure in 2017 in the US. What really struck my attention was this, this estimate, 2.5 million years of potential life lost every year. So what do we do about it? And where does it start? Well, this picture, for example, is such a clear indication that we're not dealing really with a medical problem at this point. This is an education and school system problem and care problem for the children. Here's a child who's carrying 21% of his weight and he's seven. And you can see how his spine is going to be bent. So in 20 years from now, his spine, which is the conduct for all the cervical nerves who control all the functions in the body, his health will be clearly affected. So why overburden the medical system when we can address these issues right at the root cause? Of course, we know a lot about the use of um, cell phones and EMF on kids and anxiety. And the question here is how many millions of years of potential life talent are we losing each year and what do we do about that? Now I want to move really quickly into environmental health and how we think about disease. Here's one of um, the cancers that is on uprise. The incidence of bladder cancer is increasing and the cost of the health system is higher and higher. The leading cause for blood cancer is considered the tobacco. And for about 30 years, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer has been treated with a vaccine that is developed, has been developed to, uh, against tuberculosis and it works. So that's great. Whether we know the mechanism fully or not, the fact that it works is really good. Well, the second leading cause of bladder cancer turns out is a flatworm, which is really a tropical disease that affects more than 200 million people worldwide. This disease, this tropical disease has been on the uprise and it has been on the uprise because it uses an intermediate host, a snail, and the snail population is controlled by a shrimp. And when dams were built along rivers in order to control irrigation or for whatever purposes, turns out that the dams blocked the migration 
of the shrimp, which controls the snail population, which meant now there's more snails, more parasitic worms, more exposure of humans to this disease. So what we think usually as a medical problem, as an immune system problem, and as a toxicity problem from tobacco, is actually a microbial and ecological problem and a civil engineering problem. So do we overburden the medical system and, and affect the life of people because we haven't figured out the impact that building dams along the river has on our health. So this is a dam problem that might have a microbial shrimp solution. So really, why don't we go back to the environmental issue instead of letting it go all the way to disease? In this environmental stuff, of, care, of course, how many species on the planet? Well, we don't really know. And we only study 0.0009% of all the species now. So we know very little. There's a predicted about 10 million on Earth and 2.4 million in the ocean, and an estimate that we're home to about 1 trillion species, because truth is we know, don't know 99.99% of the microbial diversity. And this microbial diversity we now know, it's not just inside of us, we're only one species, but it's inside of us as well. And we have a much higher number of microbial genes than human genes. And this is a picture of uh, the vast virus because we have been talking about this COVID and that's not the only virus that we're encountering. There's a whole population of virus that we're dealing with every day. And we have been along uh, our whole evolution because in the evolution of our planet, we've been around for much less than all these viruses. In fact, they are a model for the origin of life on the planet. We have constantly evolved in symbiosis with our organism. 8% of our DNA is derived from remnants of viral genomes. And we are going to continue to have to live together and evolve together. So in this Earth ecosystem of one human species to one trillion others, and a human ecosystem that has much more micro, many more microbial genes than human genes, we are really guests on this planet and we're hosts at the same time. So there's this quote, anonymous, uh, we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. Do we really even understand how we interact with our own planet? And truth is, we don't really know. Just last year, the end of last year, there was a paper that talked about how we actually have, as human beings, have the unconscious ability to perceive the earth's magnetic field. We've known about this in, uh, many other species, butterflies and birds and whales. And turns out we do have these uh, little uh, uh, minerals called magnetite that can transduce the magnetic field. As it turns out, the receptor for the magnetic, for ma the magnetic receptor is actually a molecule called cryptochrome, crypto from hidden light, hidden colors that gets photoactivated. Well, the human cryptochrome, cryptochrome uh, regulates the circadian, the sleep pattern. And as it, it's not expressed just in the brain or in the eyes, turns out it's everywhere in our body, in many, many organs, highest in testes, in thyroid, and 25 other tissues. And we have no idea what it does in there. But if we are unconsciously, our brains are unconsciously responding our other tissues unconsciously responding. So as it turns out, this circadian clock um, protein also regulates autoimmunity. So if you look at the big picture here, what this big picture says is that our immunity is constantly and probably unconsciously dependent on the light receptor and on, on the magnetic field of our planet. So everything that affects any technology or anything that affects the electromagnetic spectrum will by default affect our immune system. Now there's not just bad news about this, there's also good news, but good news in the fact that we don't know ourselves yet. We've thought for a long time that we can only detect, our photoreceptors can only detect the visible range of light. Well, it turns out that we can actually convert infrared light and UV light to visible. And UV light, for example, controls the neuroendocrine and the sleep pattern in rodents. So again, 
everything that affects the electromagnetic spectrum will have an effect on us, whether we know about it or not. And it's pointless to say we don't know. Because in fact, if you put together the science data that is out there, you can make a very quite accurate prediction of what is going to happen and see that we have to take care of ourselves, of our society, and of our planet. So I feel that we are at a crucial point in time where we really have to own um, the name of our own species. We've calling ourselves homo sapiens sapiens double wise. What does double wisdom mean, especially in this wake of the pandemic? It means that we have to be aware and take care of the basic needs of everyone on the planet and as a species, and that we have untapped power of our own biology and untapped power of other one trillion species on this planet, and some of them know how to regenerate their bodies. We need to be aware of our technology and build safe technology that is congruent with our biology. So my call is, as we tap into artificial intelligence, let's tap into our natural intelligence too. So in a universe that has been evolving for 13.8 billion years, we still are aware of only one planet that carries life, and that's ours. We need to start valuing it. And there are about 4,000 other planets confirmed, but we don't know that there's other life out there. So what is the message here? Message number one, we need healthier policies before we get sick. Parental care is the number one factor for the health of children. And here is a diagram of the weeks and payment for um, maternity leave and uh, home, home care. And this is true actually for paternity leave as well. And we are, um, our country is not the leading one, uh, so we need to do a little bit better in that uh, realm. Message number two is that our and our children's physiology and immune system can completely become overwhelmed by environmental and digital stress and toxicity, and we see this these days. So the message is we have to care for our immune system before it shuts down and not overburden the medical system. Message number three is actually we have amazing capacity for recovering resilience, biological capacity, that we do not fully address as a society. We're constantly collecting data about sickness, and we need to start looking more at health and healthy communities. So it would be great to implement program data to assess the recovery and health state, not just the disease state. And message number four, since we really don't know the biological capacity of not just 99% of life on earth, but the life within our own bodies, but we know that our health benefits directly from it being in balance. We need to implement a systems approach to our own health and also system programs that involve all the stakeholders from the individual to the community, to city, to state and federal and global policies. And now we can. So I want to thank you. And if you can and want to be involved in discussing some of these approaches to health and data and investing in taking action, please contact me.